Welcome to the class on Proverbs. Today we're going to take a look at Proverbs chapter 6, the first five verses. And uh, as we found very quickly, Proverbs is a very dense book. It has a lot going on in the book. And so um, we will be sprinting to get through five verses this morning. There's just a lot here. Uh, so before we go into the word of God, let's lay down a foundation of prayer as, we, as our uh, habit is. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for your continuing provision in our lives. Father, you're the one that makes the sun come up in the morning and the moon come out at night. And Father, you're the one that gives us things like air and gravity. And we take these things for granted, Father. And yet we know that not only are you the creator that created all of it, but you keep everything, everything, everything held together. And so all the processes that we take for granted, Father, forgive us for our presumption. We just thank you for looking after us and taking care of us as you do. Uh, Father, help us this morning as we look into your word to empty the stray thoughts that we have in our mind and the concerns that weigh us down and help us to open our ears and our hearts and our eyes to your word that we might take in your word and allow it to be driven deep into our hearts that we might memorize it and retain it and uh, see the things that you have here for us this morning. Lord, uh, we don't look for an academic exercise. We want to have our lives changed by what we see here, gaining guidance and wisdom that we need to navigate life and being able to pass it on to others in our lives. So we just ask these things in your guidance to the agency of your Holy Spirit this morning. And these things we lift in the precious and powerful name of your Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you can see from some of the questions here, there's some interesting uh, questions. We're going to be dealing with debt. Um, and all of us at one time or another have been in debt. And being in debt doesn't mean you're just in debt monetarily. Uh, there are things that we're in debt for and probably are still in debt uh, to and for. Um, having an understanding, a biblical understanding of this aspect of debt, realizing that Solomon is teaching his son who's at a younger age. And at a younger age, we make um, sometimes unwise decisions. So you're going to see how that plays out this morning as we get into the text. So our text this morning um, is uh, pretty simple here. Um, and remember, we've been talking about adultery, and one of the things that you find out very quickly is that Proverbs, when Proverbs was written, um, it was probably uh, codified uh, later on in Solomon's life. However, the teachings that Solomon had, you know, we can read a chapter, but there may have been five or six sessions that Solomon had with his son that were over a space of months that were recorded. And we, you know, we tend to look at this and say, oh, there's so much here, it's overwhelming. Well, taken in a bite-sized chunk, it's not overwhelming. And so oftentimes we lose sight of the fact that, you know, when the Holy Spirit inspired Solomon to write these passages down, uh, there is an actual plan that the Holy Spirit had in laying these things down. And of course, repetition being the mother of learning, you have to keep revisiting a topic and drill it deeper and deeper and deeper each time. So when we get to this topic and you say, so how does this involve, how does this relate to what we just talked about, which was adultery? Well, adultery was a breaking of a commitment, wasn't it? Sometimes we have commitments that we have to look at, and now Solomon is going to take a peek into some financial commitments that get made. So take a listen to his words. My son, if you become surety for your friends, if you've shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth, you're taken by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself for you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself, plead with your friend, give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is debt all that bad? Um, what, what's, let's take a look at our own country, America, and kind of understand what our debt is. Um, I was a bit staggered by this. Uh, first of all, 
America right now has about 333 million people. That's, a, that's a, our population right now. It continues to grow, obviously, and growth uh, is, is uh, increasing rapidly. But Americans have a lot of debt. Probably the greatest debtor nation that the world has ever seen is who we are today as a nation. So let's just take a look at this in terms of four different types of debt. These are not all the debt, but these are four areas of debt that we should probably pay attention to. So the first area of debt is, an auto, is auto loan debt. Today, Americans have a collective debt of $1.46 trillion that they owe the car manufacturers and banks and financial lenders for automobiles. Credit card debt. We collectively owe $1.03 trillion. Those 333 million people owe that. From a mortgage perspective, it's $18.3 trillion. By the way, not everyone owns property. So it's not all 333 million dollars that are 333 million people rather that um, it, this is just spread over. Although you can take a look at what the average citizen has as a debt and they don't even own the property. Um, and then student loan, we've been reading a lot about that, $1.75 trillion is what we have in current student loan. So when you break this down, um, you have to ask, so how does that relate? Those are big numbers. I don't know about you, but I have trouble you know, imagining much more than 1,000 or 10,000. So how do you look at things in the trillions? Well, if we took every man, woman, and child the share of auto uh, debt right there, everyone in this room, every baby that might be listening or two-year-old owes at this current moment in time, $4,384. That's your share of that debt. Um, credit card, uh, $3,000, every man, woman, and child. Mortgage, $54,000 and change every man, woman, and child. That's the pro rata personal share of debt. Um, student loans, uh, $5,200 per person. Now that's just four categories. By the way, it does not include with this debt burden of $67,688, doesn't include other kinds of debt that are there and doesn't include the daddy Mac of them all, the national debt. The national debt today, today about, oh, six hours ago, was at $30,638,093,784,138. And per citizen, the national debt is over $92,000 per person, in addition to, by the way, the personal debt. The national debt is what we borrow from other countries to support our standard of living here. So when you begin to look at these numbers, all of a sudden, you realize that this is an enormous amount of money and, enor and somebody has to pay it. And we keep kicking the can down the road and saying, well, we'll just put it on time. Is it any wonder that people are slaves to debt? We don't think of slavery in America as something that has happened since the Civil War, and yet it is prolific with debt that people find themselves. We enslave ourselves with debt. This is a this is a debt taken on. This is enslavement that's voluntarily entered into by every person when we take on debt. So let's now, with that background, take a look at what Solomon is trying to talk about to his son with foolish financial entanglements. My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you shake in hands and pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You're taken by the words of your mouth. So what is this in verse one, this surety and pledge, and why is why is this being, why is time being spent on? I mean, we were talking about a marriage vow, a vow that was taken before God. And we're talking just in, in the last session uh, that we looked at of, of this uh, particular book of Proverbs, 
uh, Proverbs 5. And by the way, it won't be the last time we'll talk about that, but take a look at, at why this, why is this prohibition against being a surety and a pledge? So the word surety as Arab, it means to serve as security or collateral against a default of something loaned. In other words, you're guaranteeing the loan to assure that whatever has been pledged will be performed. And so if you can't do it, who, who does it? Um, a husband and wife happen to be, while well, they're married, responsible for the collective debt of the husband and wife. That's how that works. And so we have a responsibility. And what happens if a person defaults on it? Well, this is what's being talked about, being a surety for your friend. See, in your mortgage, if you have a mortgage for your home, the equity in your home serves as the surety against default. In other words, if you took a, if you bought a home that cost you 20 years ago uh, $300,000 and you've paid down in a mortgage and you now have a balance of $88,000 left on it, A, the house is worth more than $300,000, it's probably worth double that now, and in, in, in that 20 years, and that value of the house, if you default on the loan, unless you're able, and default means you have no, no way to pay for it, then guess what happens? They come in and seize your home and that's it. And you get, and in many cases, you get nothing. So it's a guarantee they have that and that's good collateral. That's why lenders make that deal every time. It's, it's smart for them because they really don't lose out unless they bought a house that's you know, way too high and now is reduced to nothing. Um, in the culture of 950 DC, the sh uh, BC rather, one often pledged what was most valuable to them, which was their garments. Garments, you know, you and I go to Walmart and spend, you know, we'd spend five bucks on a shirt that's on a, a blouse that's on a rack. Uh, that's being sold out at next to nothing. Um, garments were an incredible uh, value in those days. It took a long time to make a garment. You think about all the robes and tunics and girdles and parts of the, the um, apparel that someone wore. It was a very expensive proposition. So they would pledge their robe. Well, they didn't have a closet full of robes. They had a robe and they pledged it, the clothing that they were wearing on their back. Now, you and I would think, gee, that's pretty gross because who wants somebody's sweated up, smelly garment? Well, the fact is that clothing was so scarce in those days and such a valuable commodity that it was valuable. And, um, you know, we look at, at that debt. Take a look at this from Exodus. Exodus 22, 26, and the first part of 27. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. Why? Because that's his only covering. It's a garment for his skin. And so people would take clothing as a surety for something. We read a lot about that in the Bible. And so that's why clothing is taken. Now, the word friend or rea is an associate by varying degrees of closeness. So it could be a close friend. It could be an acquaintance. Um, it's translated neighbor in most of the translations of the Bible, but sometimes a friend or another or a fellow. And so this is you're taking this pledge for this person. It's someone known to you, but you don't know him very well. You know who they are. You may have spent time. P plenty of the people here in this building, you know, but you don't know intimately. You don't know like a family that you live with. And sometimes we didn't know, even, don't even know our family that well. And so we, we, we have to look at what is being said here to this young son by Solomon. And so continuing the question, we know what, what surety means. What about pledge? And why is there a prohibition, prohibition against both of them? Well, they say if you've shaken your hands or shaken hands in a pledge, the uh, Hebrew there is takakop. It means to slap hands together in an agreement. It, it's where you are extending your hand with a, with a relatively quick moment, but you're doing that, and that was even in biblical times, 
the sign of a handshake agreement, an agreement. Um, you know, it used to be my word is my bond. We've shaken hands on this. We agree on this. That element of agreement still carries over, but its roots are biblical. It's interesting that Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, one of the commentators, says the allusion to the custom of, of the guarantor extending his hand with a quick movement and clasping the hand of the creditor. That's exactly what this was. Same almost identical thing we have today. Let's shake on it. And so it's the same, same essence there. It's interesting that later in Proverbs, like you find in Proverbs, it circles around and comes back to the same content multiple times. Why? Because we don't learn the first time. You know, this is no news to God. It's probably news to us, especially when we have to learn it a second and third and fourth time. And I'm not talking about getting to an age where you begin to forget things. I'm talking about we don't learn very well. And we say, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we don't. A man devoid of understanding shakes hands in a pledge and becomes surety for his friends. Same identical thought here as in verse one and two of Proverbs six. A, a person is devoid of understanding. They're acting stupidly is what it's saying in present day vernacular. Now, the stranger, the word is zur, and it means a foreigner, but not you know, as we would look at a foreigner, the foreigner here is somebody who is non-Jewish. For us, a Zur would be an, a non-Christian. So here it's someone who, who is, and it means someone that's not known. You don't really know that person because as a non-Jew, they wouldn't be part of the circle of acquaintances that you have. Um, they're, they're, they would be considered an alien or a foreigner or a stranger or an outsider, but they're not of your family. This is someone you do not know, and what the prohibition here is, but you're guaranteeing that, they're, that you are going to make good on their promise? That seems to be rather outrageous, and you and I probably wouldn't do that. A stranger walks up to you and says, hey, would you mind signing? I just uh, took a $1,000 loan. Would you mind co-signing that for me? I don't know of any of you that would actually do that. I don't think too many people would do that. You know, maybe we were born at night, but not last night. The fact is that we we have to we we wouldn't do that. That is not prudent. That is devoid of understanding. And yet, why is he saying this to his son? Doesn't his son know that? Have you sat down with kids recently and talked to them about the things that they say and, and statements that they make? See, only a fool would guarantee a debt, somebody else's debt, especially a stranger. And yet kids do this all the time. They make promises. They make proclamations that they never plan. You know, they just say it because they're being a friend. And, you know, it, it, it was permissible and expected, by the way, the family member would stand in as a guarantor. That was typically the custom in this culture. The family member would always stand in as a guarantor or as surety to preserve the honor of the family. Remember, my son, builder of the family name, is the whole family honor is involved here. Don't make something, don't make a commitment because you know, you're gonna have to fulfill it because that's who we are as a family. Proverbs 6.1 is really a prohibition to not act rashly and entangle yourself with someone else's debts. It's never good business to do that. But again, Remember who he's talking to, someone who's young and inexperienced and hasn't seen life, enough of life. So why are all pledges and promises and commitments binding once given? So we really have to explore that because if this is a prohibition, then why would I have to make good over somebody? You know, I'm just helping them out. I'm just reassuring them, tell them, no problem, go ahead with it because I'm thinking that they're going to pay for it. So why am I on the hook for it? In other words, God is a party, by the way, to every single agreement. Why? Because it's given in his sight. Remember, he not only sees everything, but he knows what every person's thinking. And he knows when the person says, hey, look, it just lend it to me for a week. I'll have it back to you. Huh. 
if you agree, you're on the hook. And it's not dependent on whether or not that person has it back to you. You performed it, and then they may, you know, shuffle off to Buffalo and never see them. In many cases, we swear God's name on a contract. God expects to us to honor every single commitment that we make, no exceptions. By the way, that goes for saying to someone, I'll meet you at 3 o'clock tomorrow at such and such. I will call you tomorrow by 5 p.m. That's a commitment. And you are a, the bearer of Christ's name as a Christian. Everything you do <laughs> involves him because it's his family honor, builder of the family name. You're a builder of the family name as a Christian. So don't forget that. James 5.12 says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear. In other words, don't take an oath, either by heaven or earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. How do you fall into judgment? When you can't do what you just said you do. I swear I'll do this. How many times do we say that? How many times do kids say that? You know, I swear on my mother's grave. If that was true, most of the graveyards would have dug up graves because that was said without intending to be fulfilled, and yet we wanted to impress the hearer with how convicted we were. Solomon is warning his son of the danger that we have of anything that we do rashly because the person that does something is expected to keep the pledge. Now, the son might have said something to reassure the stranger, which he didn't really mean. Once he said, by the way, he would be expected to do it, regardless of what happens from that point forward, he's on the hook. And remember, the Jews considered themselves God's favored nation, so they also took along that aspect of builder of the family name because the word Israel is prince of God. So we have to understand that who you are carries this burden of fulfilling what you say. Jesus, by the way, if there's any doubt about this, Jesus says that we will be accountable. Jesus says, but I say unto you in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, but I say unto you that for every idle word Every idle word, you didn't mean it. I just said it, but I really didn't mean it. I didn't think it through. I just said it. For every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. By the way, does this apply just to believers? No. It applies to everyone. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Even the unbeliever is held to this standard of doing what they said they would do. Ah, now we get an idea of why this is such an important topic to cover early in the book of Proverbs and why you cover it early with your children. Okay, so verse one sets up the if, and then we need to look at the if and the then. So. It says here, my son, if you become surety for your friend, if you've shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You're taken by the words of your mouth. Okay, we have some ifs and thens. So what are the ifs and thens? The word snared, by the way, is the Hebrew word yakash. It means to be caught in a net or a snare. And so just like this animal is trapped, the more you try to struggle, the, the more you can't get out. The word taken is almost the same thing. It's lakad. It means to catch in a net or a pit or a snare. You're taken. You're captured. Okay. Both convey the thought that once caught, there's no escape. And by the way, this animal, the more the animal struggles, the worse it is because paws go through the holes in the net and then they're in deep, deep trouble and they can't even move. Consider the context here of Solomon teaching a young child God's truth, such an important thing. How many things does a child say without really meeting them? This is one of the things that, that we have that as parents and grandparents, you see in the children and grandchildren, especially when they're really young, they say something, but then 
two seconds later, they're not doing it. You know, I'll eat my dinner. 20 minutes later, it's still sitting there, not a bite's touched. We, we go through these things. And we need at an early age to be reminded when we say we're going to do something, we've made a pledge that is in the sight of God and we are responsible for it. So that promise that we make, the child makes, and now the dad is teaching this child now who's old enough to understand that when you give your word for something, you're expected to follow through and do what you said you would do. Here the guarantors are stuck. Now notice that he's saying, if my son, if you become this guarantor of surety, you're the one who's going to be caught and stuck. You can't free yourself. You have to pay the obligation because you said you'd do it. That's the challenge. You said you would do it. I love this from Ecclesiastes, by the way, also penned by Solomon. Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. By the way, how much do we utter that's before God? 100.000% of it, all of it, all of it is uttered before God. God is a witness to everything you think, say, or do. He hears your thoughts before you speak them. So we're doing this before God. For God is in heaven and you on earth. Let Therefore, let your words be few. You know, we love that uh, Phillips, Craig, and Dean song from probably 15 years ago, Let My Words Be Few. I love that song. It is fantastic. It's the words are important. Let my words be few. By the way, we'll see later in Proverbs, in the multitude of words, there is much sin. Verse three, for a dream comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by his many words. You know, people that just run at the mouth constantly are always talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't shut up. Yeah, they're actually self-identifying themselves because in many cases they are fools. A fool's voice is known by as many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not to pay. Somebody's pressing you to agree to do something. It's better to say no than to agree to do it and then not do it. That's what the point is. Bottom line, these two verses, verses one and two in chapter six, form something called an integral proverb. Because verse two gives the consequences of verse one. Remember that there's all sorts. You go back to some of the first, I think probably the first or the second um, lesson, which is recorded and on our website and available to you at any time to listen to, that talks about the classifications of Proverbs. And this is an integral proverb. Not sure what you do with that, but that's what it is. So what's a contemporary example? We're living in 2022 here. Uh, what's a contemporary example? I, I want you to meet a couple of friends, Terrence and Jerome. Terrence is on the left, Jerome on the right, uh, your left and your right here. Um, have been best friends since the first, gr first grade. They went to the same church. They grew up together. They went to the same youth group. They've been hanging out. They're always hanging out. But Jerome, throughout his life, has always been the more responsible of the two. Jerome was the kid who was mowing lawns in the neighborhood. Jerome was the kid who was doing extra work, helping out the neighbor. And Jerome has been the more responsible of the two. Now, the problem comes into... Uh, sight here when Terrence has his eye on this car and he's really wanted to have a car. He now has a job. He needs to have a car to get to his work. And so he's been uh, looking at this particular car, but unfortunately he doesn't have much of a work history and the bank is not going to lend him money. And he knows that his dad won't do it and his mom won't do it and his uncle won't do it. And so who does he turn to? His good buddy, Jerome. And so Jerome agrees to co-sign on Terrence's car because Terrence has established credit, or Jerome has established credit rather, and Terrence does not. So you get the idea. One is more responsible. So go ahead, you know, Jerome, come on, be, be a good friend, and Jerome is and signs on it. Well, the problem is, after about eight months, uh, Terrence forgot to renew his car insurance. 
and subsequently his car was stolen. So it's not insured, it's stolen, the bank owns most of it, and he doesn't have the money to pay for it. And the bank is saying, uh, you gotta pay. And the bank is saying, uh, Jerome, uh, if, if Terrence isn't gonna pay, you're gonna have to pay. That's a pretty, that's a, a, a common day example of how you can get yourself into trouble with co-signing. You mean the best of intentions. First point is this, God does not want us to become debtors because debtors become the slave to a creditor. The debt you owe, you are a slave to that debt. I showed you a whole bunch of debt that people owe or don't owe, but what the American debt is. The point is this, God sent his son to die at Calvary so that we would no longer be a debtor to sin. He didn't free you from being a debtor to sin so you could be a debtor to a creditor, a slave to debt. And so that is something that as a Christian, you, when you have paid all of your debts, and so most of you took out a mortgage and most of you have you know, worked yourself down from under the mountain of debt, Okay, here's how would you like to be the co-signer of Terrence's stolen car? You know, that thing's got, you know, $30,000 of balance probably due on it. <laughs> You're going to cough that up? Hmm. So do this, my son. This is dad's advice. Do this, my son, and deliver yourself for you've come into the hand of your friend. To Rome, you've come into the hand of Terence. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So how should a parent respond when his or her child has made a foolish decision committing to be responsible for another person's debt? Now, Jerome is driving himself crazy and obviously mom and dad know and eventually it comes out and the conversation that now Jerome, eight months removed from becoming the co-signer is going to his dad, come on dad, I didn't think he'd expect me to pay his debt, I was just trying to help him out, he's my buddy Terrence. You see, it gets worse because more people are sucked into the discussion. So how should the parent respond? Well. Let's take a look. First of all, let's talk about what a parent should not do. A parent should not step in and take care of the child's obligation, relieving him or her of the responsibility to do what the child said he would do. The parent didn't make that commitment. Now, if the, if the child is underage, it may be that the banks go after Jerome's parents. But the thought here is that the parent is not should not go in and rescue because where is the learning for Jerome? I'll never do it again. No. How do you know? You see, the lessons that we as human beings tend to learn are the lessons where we make a mistake and we have to pay the consequences of our own mistakes. I can't speak for you, but I can certainly speak for myself and say that I'm a hardhead. And as a hardhead, Coming from a family of hardheads, I have made mistakes that I've had to pay for, and that's the only way that I've learned. And that's the way that we have to learn from the mistakes that we make. So the first thing you don't do as a parent is jump in and say, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. You know, un unless you're Bill Gates and, you know, have all the money in the world. But how's your child going to learn that? These are important life lessons. How do you teach your children? This is really what the book of Proverbs is about, teaching your children. See, the, patient, the parents should not sit there and rip the kid a new one and lecture and berate and yell at the kid for making a bad decision. That's not going to teach anything. It's just going to, you know, when we yell at someone to scold them, they don't remember what we, what we said. They remember how we made them feel. This is true, by the way, of bosses and employees. 
It's true of anyone giving somebody else feedback about something. If you are angry with them and you yell at them and you make them feel bad, they never heard what you said, but they know how you made them feel. And that's not going to help Jerome here. Jerome has made a horrible decision. And dad does what dad should do is points Jerome back to what dad, what Jerome needs to do. The parent has to see the opportunity here to help his child learn the important life lessons of serving as a guarantor. If you serve as a guarantor for someone you were making, you need to have a lesson because you're going to be on the hook for it. So what do you do? The first thing that dad says in this passage is you got to take responsibility. Jerome, you did this. You have to take responsibility. Deliver yourself. If you seen that is stated twice in this particular passage right there on the screen. Deliver yourself. Deliver yourself. You have to do it. It's not I'll deliver you and take care of it or just ignore it. It's not your problem. No. You have to take responsibility because you're the one that served as a guarantor. So two alternatives here. Pretty simple. You could pay off the debt for your friend, which is implied there. That's one way to do it. Or the specific advice given by dad is go plead with your friend to make good on his promise to pay for it and not make you have to pay for his debt. That's the first thing you do. Note that the parent doesn't solve the problem for his or her child. That is not good parenting. Consequences. Look, when Adam and Eve decided to sin, to disobey God, there were consequences. God said, you shall surely die. What died? Adam and Eve's spirit, their connection with God. That, their spirit died that moment. And they spent the rest of their life realizing that God said he would provide a way through his son, the seed of the woman. You remember the conversation that he had with Adam, Eve, and the serpent in the Garden of Eden said, one day I'm going to restore this spirit. That's why you had to become born again. That's why you were required to go from being a body and soul. See, Adam and Eve lived in their body and soul. Their body and soul continued for a lot of hundreds of years, we're told in the book of Genesis. The fact is that what they needed to do, like you and I needed to do, is we needed to go through that point in time where we were born again. We confessed our sin that we could not pay the cost, and Jesus Christ was the only one that could pay the cost and pay that price. And as a result, of accepting Jesus Christ's payment for our sin, we became justified. That's why we have these posters up on the wall in the classroom here. We became justified, just as if we had not had a sin. Jesus paid our debt. Jesus, in fact, through your act of confession of your sin and claiming him as your savior, you asked him to make good on your debt, and he did. He paid for your debt on Calvary. He died once for all on Calvary. You added to that debt burden that he had. You say, well, how can he do this? Because he wasn't born yet. Remember, God is outside of time. Everyone was saved by anticipatory salvation in the Old Testament, believing the same thing you and I do. But look at the fact that God the Son became your co-signer and guarantor of your debt and paid for it. Puts things in a little bit different perspective. All right. So what guidance does this passage provide as to the how the guarantor should proceed, that being Terrence and our story, has once he has been placed in himself into the position of being a guarantor of Terrence's debt? Here we go. Jerome, what do you do? First thing is, notice what the statement says. Hebrew reads right to left. So do this now. We read those words in the Hebrew. We can see them. We can see all the numbers, the 
how that looks. The Hebrew contains immediacy and intensity. It's like the English says, do it now. This Hebrew says, do it now. It's a loud, imperative command to do it now. So here's how we should be looking at verse three. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself for you've come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself, plead with your friend. First is you've got to go deliver yourself. Recognize that you are responsible for the, for the debt. You're responsible for his debt in this case because you've made a foolish pledge. Deliver yourself from that. You have to fulfill that pledge unless your friend releases you. Or the bank in this case releases you. You've come into the hand of your friend. What does that mean? Well, you have to take immediate action in delivering yourself because you have come into his power. He can say, look, I didn't force you to co-sign, but you have to make good on this. But it's not my car. No, you, you signed. You said you would do this. You have to make good. Well, where are you in this? Doesn't matter where I am. You said you would sign. You see, you can get into this issue. But he's my friend. I've known him since childhood. Hmm. Humble yourself. Very important point. Humble yourself. Why did you agree to do it in the first place? I suspect it was a matter of a little bit of pride on your part that I can do it because I have a job and a good credit history. Sure. <laughs> Humble yourself. The word yalak. Rafak, to make oneself prostrate, fall on your face before that person, tread yourself down, demean. There's no time for being macho or having an ego about it. This is humble yourself. Remember, dad's yelling this, do it now, do it now, do it now. Plead with your friends. The word here is raha, means to urge intensely to prevail, to greatly demean yourself. So this humble yourself, plead with your friend is a sort of a continuous thought process here of pleading and demeaning yourself. You did something wrong by agreeing to serve as surety. On one hand, deep humility. On the other hand, intense pleading. You, you get this conflicting sense in the Hebrew that this is a this is a desperate situation. Realizing that dad isn't prepared to sit there and write the check. By the way, have you stopped to thank your savior for taking your place on the cross and paying the debt that you couldn't because he served as your guarantor and you didn't even ask him to? The only time that you asked him to was at the point in time where you confessed him as your Lord and Savior. We are debtors to our Lord Christ. He paid what we could not pay. And I'm sure Solomon, in his wisdom, is talking to his son about the foolishness of agreeing to take on a debt that he couldn't pay. So let's go into this, this a little bit further. The first thing so far that dad has su suggested to his son was to visit his friend and confess that he had made a terrible mistake. Uh, obviously, this is happening before in the story that I gave you, the situation that the car got stolen. The terrible mistake has been made, asked to be released from it. That's what he needs to do. Absent this, the son is responsible. If his friend refuses after being pled with and refuses, he's on the hook for it. So in a couple of months when the car gets stolen, he's going to be on the hook for it. So again, I'm trying to give you a contemporary story of how this might work in our society. So wisdom would have been to politely refuse to serve as a guarantor. Wisdom would have told you right in the beginning, you don't serve as surety for someone like this. Unless again, you were so wealthy that if the money is defaulted, and by the way, if you're so wealthy, why don't you just give them that? 
but you're not that wealthy. So refusing to, to wisdom says refuse to do it. So notice the next point here. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. This means probably the parent learned about this commitment. It probably came out, you know, within a week or two of, of Jerome signing for Terrence. And now it's at the end of the day, probably at the evening meal. You can kind of picture it that dad's found out he's gone ballistic. He's now confronted his son about it. His son said, well, I'm just trying to help out. And guess what? He's saying, look, I know it's late. It's dinner time. It's in the evening. You plan to go do this or do that. Guess what? You need to go now. Don't wait for tomorrow. I'll wait for tomorrow. I'll wait for tomorrow. I'll wait for tomorrow. Dad urges his son immediately to go to his friend. Don't wait for the next day. Get the matter resolved now. If you do this, if you find yourself in this situation and you go, uh-oh, that's the time to go immediately go and try to undo it. See, the key is this. Wisdom and maturity says when you discover a mistake, don't let it age. Take immediate response. Mistakes get worse. It's like an illness or a disease. It gets worse if you don't address it right away. You know, if you start getting the sniffles and you start getting a sore throat, what do you, what do, you do? You take, you, you know, you take some type of cold medicine and you try to prevent it. You take a dose of vitamin C, you try to prevent it to keep it from getting bad. That's the point. Don't let a single day, don't let a moment go by. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the fowler, the hand of a fowler, one who catches birds. So what guidance does this provide? How the guarantor should proceed? Once again, he's placed himself under the role of being a guarantor. <coughs> Two examples are provided in this, to, that how he needs to plead for his friend to be releasing him. So there is a figure of speech here being used, the word like, like a gazelle, like a bird. That is a simile. It compares by resemblance. So what do we know about a gazelle and by a bird that helps us to understand how Dad saying to his son, this is how you need to get out of it. First of all, a gazelle, a tzibi, is a roe, a roebuck, a gazelle, a springbuck would fit this. It's an emblem of speed and suddenness. If you ever watch any of the nature shows, all of a sudden there's a noise over here and one of those, those gazelle, boom, in the air, choom, gone immediately, very, very fast. That's what you need to do, son. When confused or confronted by danger, gazelle can right there and to escape the pursuers. That's what you need to do, escape quickly. All right, the bird, a tsipur is a small bird, specifically a sparrow, common bird. When caught in a net, if you watch a sparrow will struggle with every ounce of strength that that bird has to extricate itself and it's relentless. It doesn't just, oh, okay, I'm stuck, too bad. You know, your cat might, a dog might pretty soon, but not a bird, not a bird like that, because the bird realizes the bird is dead if the bird doesn't escape. And so here, this, this frantic, fierce flight and fight to be removed from the net, from this snare, this being a guarantor. All right. So that's how how he's to go ahead and do it. But you know, we also need to take a look at how Jesus helped us to understand this whole aspect of indebtedness and how we need to look at debt. Again, you and I are debtors to a savior that paid for our salvation, which places us in a position of being able to understand that when we came to faith, we understood that we could not free ourselves. So we tried what Solomon suggested to his son to try to get yourself out of it. You know, we couldn't go ahead and, and plead with God to release us from the requirement to live perfect lives. 
especially when he made a solution for us to be freed from the penalty of death. So we ourselves were in the position of being a debtor and having to go to someone who was a guarantor because before the foundations of the world, long before you were even thought of, the fact is that God knew man would sin and God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the payment in full, the propitiation for that sin, to release us from the debt that we had, which would have said at the end of your mortal life, you get a chance to spend all of eternity in a resurrected body that cannot decay. Guess what? You all get one, except you get to spend it in the smoking section. And what's smoking? You. And not with cigarettes. You get a chance to spend eternity in the lake of fire where you don't die and the fire never goes out. That's the penalty for you get removed from God's protection and from his presence. But as a Christian, we need to understand how Jesus looks at debt. And there's a really interesting passage that I came across here in Matthew, and I want us to take a look at it. Matthew 18, 23 to 27. Matthew's describing to his disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like when the debt is called for. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. All right. When he, the master or the king, began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children. Guess what? There's always collateral damage whenever you make decisions because you're going to involve others. So the servant's not able to pay the 10,000 uh, talents. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, all that he had, that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave the debt. Get this, the king had a servant who was told to do certain things and apparently had worked up a debt of 10,000 talents. We'll understand what that means in just a minute. And when called to settle the debt, to make good on his debt, he said, I can't pay it. What happened is he said, I can't pay it, but if you give me time, I will pay it. And so the king said, okay, I get you can't pay this. Guess what? I'm going to relieve you of this debt. Wow. Relieved of a debt of 10,000 talents. Wait till you understand what a talent is. Released from the debt. Okay. So let's go on the story. Story continues, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on his friend, grabbed him, took him by the throat and said, pay, what you, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant, like this fellow did, the first servant did, fell down to his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. So let's understand a couple of things here about this passage. What light does Jesus' parable shine on, rather, the subject of very foolish financial engagements, entanglements? Well, first of all, a talent or a talenton in the Greek is an amount of silver, about 130 pounds, which represented about 20 years wages. That's what one talent is. And a denarii or denarion is a small silver coin which represented a day's wages. There were 6,000 denarii in one talent. Get, get this, 6,000 denarii in one talent, a talent then represented 20 years wages. What did a servant then do, and that's what I wanna know, that incurred a debt of 60 million days wages? That can't be paid by a human being, can it? No. The debt that you and I have for our sin cannot be paid by you. 
a mortal human being. It took God the Son to pay that debt for you. Get the, get the resemblance here between the king, God the Father, who sent his son and made the payment on your behalf and forgave you that debt. Because it's much larger than you will ever be able to pay, even if you lived virtually forever, which you can't. The first servant upon settling of debts threw himself on the mercy of the king and begged for more time to pay his obligation in a way similar to the guarantor in treating his friend to relieve him of the obligation of being the guarantor. Don't miss that. I'm mixing two things that are different, but you can see the elements in both stories, hopefully. All right, let's continue with the Matthew account. Matthew 18, 29 to 34. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. But And he would not, this second servant, the first servant says, I'm having none of it. He went and threw that second servant into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, how does that work? If you're in prison, uh, where, how, do you, how do you pay the debt? Pretty interesting. Your livelihood's taken away from you, for one thing. Now, when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved, and they came and told their master all that had been done. Their master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers, oy, until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So this aspect of foolish financial entanglements there are side issues to this about forgiveness and compassion that we can't miss. That's really critical to our understanding of what this has to say. See, the king showed extreme mercy to the first servant's request for more time. The first servant just said, give me more time. I'm still on the hook for it. What the king did, like God, always forgave everything. That's why 1 John says if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us all our sins. We can confess only what we know. That ain't the list of our sins. That's a small part of our sins. God forgives all. Understand, a debt that the servant could never pay is the same debt that you and I can't pay. You see, we're debtors also, and being debtors to our God who paid for our debt as the guarantor it cost the son his life, his blood was spilled so you could have your debt settled and not held against you, that should enable us as Christians maturing believers to have a very different perspective on financial entanglements. We ought to have wisdom for one thing, because we saw how it cost the life of God the Son to pay for our debt that we couldn't pay for ourselves. And now we realize that God the Son made good on his debt. He settled it. It cost him his life. I don't know of too many people that are willing to, to, to let their life go and die to save a friend. So we can understand that God's level, what God's asking of us as smart people with wisdom, don't make stupid obligations you can't fulfill. You see, the recipient of the mercy showed no mercy. He simply grabbed the fellow servant by the throat, not a friendly, hey, can I come talk to you? No, just grabbed him by the throat, demanded immediate payment for 100 days wages. Having him imprisoned, no means to pay for it, which even of itself shows the fact that the second, the this, this servant that was forgiven his debt wasn't thinking. See, God did not save you to not think, just as God did not save you to become a debtor by making a foolish financial 
arrangement. God saved you so that you would have an appetite, a thirst, an unquenchable need to understand God's wisdom. That's why he provided us this book of Proverbs, God's wisdom. We should have a thirst for it by, because we recognize what he did. And yet we look at this area of foolish financial entanglements and Christians make some of the stupidest mistakes with guaranteeing and taking on more debt than they can afford to take on. We should not be slaves to debt because we have been freed from the debt of our sin. We should not voluntarily put ourselves into debt. God Almighty, the king who pays the debts we cannot, his price was salvation, seeks evidence of mercy in each one of the people that he created. So where is that mercy? So if Terence and Jerome are faced with this issue, Terence should recognize that his friend Jerome, when he comes to him, should have mercy on Jerome and say, okay, we're going back in and I'm going to have to make other arrangements for this car. Maybe I have to sell the car. Maybe I have to do something and make another arrangement. You see, that's the conversation that has to be entered into. You will make mistakes. I will make mistakes. When you recognize quickly that you've made a mistake, take care of it right away. Look, you and I are accountable to God for the commitments that you and I make, as well as using the wisdom that should govern the commitments that we make. That's something that should come through loud and clear about this passage in Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wisdom that you've given us in this book and how incredibly timely this wisdom is because when we see the larger picture, we see what you did on our behalf when we could not pay the debt to be free of our sin, you paid it. You were the guarantor and you paid it. And Lord, you are faithful in discharging your duties and you expect nothing less of us as the people that bear your name to be faithful in dis discharging the commitments that we make. And yet Lord, in some of these commitments, we do so foolishly. Help us to have the wisdom to see this truth and to apply this truth in our life. Help us to not be living above our means. Help us to do without before we incur more debt and place ourselves under the oppression and slavehood of being a debtor. Father, help us to see the wisdom of applying this. Help us to teach our children and grandchildren this important lesson about making foolish financial commitments. Father, there's much in this world that tries to cause us to make bad judgments. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to give us the wisdom and the discernment and the knowledge and the understanding, Lord, to be able to see these things and have the perspective, have the perception to see these things for what they are and walk wisely. You've given us a wonderful life, Father. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you are doing, and all that you will continue to do. And Lord, Above all else, help us to have wisdom. Help us to have wisdom and discernment in the way that we walk so that we walk worthy of your name, the name of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen.